last week, as we started our new year looking at vision, we talked about the opportunity that we have as a church in this place for this time. Um, God has brought us together for a purpose um, and for us to respond to what that is, what He wants to do in us and through us as a church. And today I want to narrow that down to us as individuals. Um, how are we to walk in a manner worthy of the calling that we have received the really, at the really basic level? That's what we want to talk about today, because it's all well and good when we're talking corporately, and you know, as a church, we're going to do this and we're going to do that. But what about us as individuals? When we look at ourselves and where we are, what does that actually mean? Um, by about Wednesday morning of this week, I had the most part of a, a, another sermon written that had to do with God's cosmic agenda for the world and our part in that. Sounds good, doesn't it? Sounds impressive. Not really. People are all going, no, not really. Um, but it was a big sermon, and it was, it, was, it was about the drama of what God's doing in the wider world and our part in that. And it was, it was a good sermon. You'll maybe hear it sometime in the future. Who knows? Um, but I just could not get out of my mind um, that that wasn't what God wanted to say. It was a, a totally other direction, which is a bit of an inconvenience, let's be honest, on Wednesday. But God is God, and God can do that. So I had really felt him putting another direction on my heart, and it was actually from a phrase in Micah verse, or chapter 6. And I would love it if you have your Bible with you to go to the book of Micah. It's nearly the end of the Old Testament. You go to the New Testament, then go back a few books, you'll find the book of Micah. Now, it doesn't sound as dramatic or spectacular or as exciting, but I hope and I know that God's going to encourage you and equip you to live as God's people through it. If you don't know the book of Micah, it's one of the smaller, minor prophet um, books. Um, and Micah was a prophet of God around the same time as Isaiah. He lived before the Assyrians and the Babylonians came to destroy Israel and Judah. And he lived around 700 to 800 years before Jesus came. He lived in a very small village, just um, some way out of Jerusalem. And the nation of Israel at that time was a real mess. They had been walking in disobedience and rebellion towards God consistently for about 500 years. So constantly doing the wrong thing, saying no to God, saying yes to themselves. That was the nation that Micah spoke into. And I want to read from the start of chapter 6 of Micah. So this is God's complaint towards his people there, okay? This is what God says to his people through the prophet Micah. Listen to what the Lord says. Stand up, plead my case before the mountains. Let the hills hear what I have to say. Hear, you mountains, the Lord's accusation. Listen, you everlasting foundations of the earth. For the Lord has a case against his people. He is lodging a charge against Israel. My people, what have you done? What have you done? And what have I done to you? How have I burdened you? Answer me. I brought you up out of the land of Egypt and redeemed you from the land of slavery. I sent Moses to lead you, also Aaron and Miriam. And people remember what Balak, king of Moab, plotted and what Balaam, son of Beor, answered. Remember your journey from Shittim to Gilgal, that you may know the righteous acts of the Lord. Now, we'll stop it there. We're going to move on in just a minute. But God has a problem with his people. He's angry with them because they have forgotten that he was the one who brought them out of slavery, led them through the wilderness, and into where they now are. In our day, and it's important that we say this, nobody wants to be offended. Nobody wants to be told they're wrong. And they're not doing the right thing. Everybody has an attitude, I'm okay, you're okay, you do what you want, I'll do what I want, and we'll all be okay. Folks, God, our God is not okay with that. He has things that are right, things that are wrong, and he calls us as his people to walk in the right way. See, God is still a God who challenges people of wrongdoing. He's still a God who says, that is not right. That's our God. We sang about him this morning, holy, holy, holy. Lord God Almighty, that's who he is. He gets to say what's right and what's not. There should be times when God challenges us, convicts us of our wrong, wrongdoing, and calls us to live in a better way. Any good father will challenge their children. Any loving father, as hard as it is, my heart breaks when Zoe's weeping and wailing when she's done something wrong and I have to put her on that step or tell her off. And she's going, Daddy, Daddy, I don't like you anymore. I want to run away, you know, or whatever it is that she says. My heart breaks. But if I am being a loving father to her, I have to tell her what's right and what's not right. Our loving Heavenly Father is exactly the same. 
See, when our God speaks to us about sin and about righteousness, we need to stop and we need to listen. It's not okay to say to God what we say to everybody else. I'm okay, you're okay, you get on with your thing, I get on with my thing. When God says no, we need to put our hands up and say, God, we're sorry. This is the start of a new year, and it's the start of a new day in God. I would encourage you, if God is putting his finger on any area of your life that you know is not right, put it right now. And walk this new year in the life that he's called you to walk in, in the right way that he's called you to walk in. I believe in the process of sanctification and growing in holiness. No, but it's a bit old-fashioned, I know, but it's absolutely biblical. That when he redeems us and he saves us, he calls us on a journey of consistently putting off the old and walking in the new. So that is absolutely right and proper. And we want to be a people who preach that and walk in more of the identity of who we are. We don't live right to be right. We are made right, so we live right. And we've heard a lot of that this morning. So walk in the identity that you've been given. But we're not going to focus too much. You say, I will, you've already focused on it. We're not going to focus too much on that first part of God's complaint. It's the second two parts of this passage that I want to look at, the next two sections. So if you go to verse 6, in the prophetic literature, when you're reading the prophetic books, um, and it can seem a bit confusing because the prophets often speak as the mouth of God, then they speak as themselves, and then they speak what the nation might say back to God. So when you're reading it, sometimes you can think, oh, what, what does he mean? Is he speaking as God? He's speaking as himself. He's speaking as the people. But in the poetic um, language that the prophets use, that's how they speak. The next part of this section in verse 6, that's what Mike is going to do. He is going to preempt or imagine what it is that the people might say back to God after God has made their complaint. Does that make sense? Yeah, hopefully. Hopefully that makes sense. It'll help you understand what comes next. So Micah the prophet pre-imagines or preempts what it is that the people might say in response to God's complaint. And this is what they might say, verse six. With what shall we come before the Lord and bow down before the exalted God? Shall I come with him, before him with burnt offerings, with calves a year old? Will the Lord be pleased with thousands of rams and 10,000 rivers of olive oil? Shall I offer my firstborn for the transgression, the fruit of my body for the sin of my soul? See, what they're basically saying or what he's imagining they might say is that what great thing can I do for God that's going to make me right? That's what they're saying. That's what he thinks they're going to say. God comes with a complaint. The people are going to say, well, what am I going to do? What great thing am I going to offer? Am I going to offer the olive oil, even the fruit of my own body, the firstborn? Am I going to do that great thing for God? And it's this I want to focus on for just a minute. What great thing are we going to do for God that we're going to make things right with him? What great thing could we do in response to this holy, holy God? When we talk about vision and living for God like we did last week, because we're in a, a Western context, a bit of an American dream context, a celebrity culture, entrepreneurs, self-made millionaires, when we think about living for God, we often begin with thinking, what great thing can we do for God? What big way are we going to make our mark on this world for God? We think about the dramatic, the spectacular, the earth shattering. Someone doesn't like the sermon. It's okay. Don't worry about it, wee man. We often think about the great way that we're going to impress God. What would be a fitting response to what it is that God has done? I've said this a few times, but it's relevant for this morning. The formative years of my Christian life throughout my teenage years were me reading books like The Prayer of Jabez, Breaking Through to the Best Life Now. God's Generals, which were about stories about great healing evangelists of the past, got me excited about doing something big for God, got me excited about changing the world for God. And in my youth, I went to lots of youth events. Some of them were here. Some of them were out in the field and up in the Robinson Shed, up the road at Bible Week, things like that. And we sang songs there. The worship leader, which was Griff, and I was playing guitar at the time, we sang songs like History Maker, by the band Delirious. Everyone remember that song? Some people do. Delirious were a, a quite a trendy band back in the day when I was a teenager. But I want to read you some of these words. First one, is it true today that when people pray, cloudless skies will break, kings and queens will shake? Is it true today that when people pray, we'll see dead men rise and the blind set free? 
Verse 3, is it true today when people stand with the fire of God and the truth in hand, we'll see miracles, we'll see angels sing, we'll see broken hearts making history? Good words, aren't they? We were all dancing about on stage, falling off the speakers, thinking it was all great. You know, back in the day, that's what we did. We proclaimed this truth on a, on a consistent basis. And as I spent time listening to those songs and reading these books, listening to preachers at youth events who told me that I could do anything through Christ and I was going to change the world, at those events and at those services, I got really excited, got really, really pumped, you know, sweat and everything going on. It was just like, let's go. Let's kill dead things. Let's raise dead things. Everything will be great. But see, when you hit work on a Monday morning and a Monday afternoon, when things aren't quite going that way, that's an understatement. <laughs> when, when things were not changing in dramatic fashion all around me, I began to get a bit disheartened. By Monday afternoon, and in between times of the events, I felt deflated, frustrated, bored. Something had happened in my mind where I had separated the present reality with those things that I was singing and reading about. The normality of life. With this dramatic big thing that God wanted to do in me and I wanted to do for God, I kind of got a bit bored with everyday life, a bit frustrated. I was working in retail at the time, and I went into work feeling a bit deflated, a bit frustrated, a bit bored, thinking, how can I change the world when all I'm doing is changing this guy's trousers because his wedding suit's too long? And you can imagine my excitement when we, um, Peter came in to get his first formal suit, and he couldn't decide what color of cravat he wanted. You can picture how excited I was about serving that family in that moment, can you? Can you picture that? I was a picture of enthusiasm and patience, not really. I was fed up, I was bored, I was frustrated because I was missing what it meant to be a child of God in the now because I was looking for the big thing in the future. I was annoyed that the world was not changing around me. <clears throat> now maybe some of you are thinking, we should be people who chase the impossible. We're Pentecostals, we believe in the more. Folks, by all means, believe in the more. Believe in the impossible, but make sure you're walking and being a child of God in it today. Believe in the more and sing the songs, there must be more than this, and be a history maker, but make sure you're actually living your life that God has called you to now before you get to there, because it's really, really important that we do that. Rejoicing in the fact that you are saved, that you are alive in God, that you are His and He is yours, that you're a citizen of heaven, filled with the Spirit now in the present. I want to say something back into the me of 16 or 17 or 15 years old when we sing those songs. Is it true today that when people pray, cloudless skies will break, kings and queens will shake? Sometimes. Is it true today when people pray, we'll see dead men rise and the blind set free? Sometimes. When the people of God stand with fire in hand and the truth in hand, we'll see miracles and angels sing, broken hearts making history? Sometimes. And the last verse or the last chorus, I'm going to be a history maker in this land. I'm going to be a speaker of truth to all mankind. I want to say, what about being a Christian? What about just being a Christian today? What about living in faithfulness before God in the everyday? See, before we make history, folks, some of us need to learn to make our beds in the morning. Before we make history, some of us need to know how to make a meal for our families. Before we make history, some of us need to make an effort to love our neighbor who lives next door to us. Before we make history, we need to make better choices about what newspapers we buy and what websites we visit. Before we make history, some of us need to make better choices about what TV programs we watch. Now that sounds so, oh, Bill, I want to be singing History Maker. By all means, sing it. But make sure you're doing the simple things right. Make sure you're doing the things that he's called you to today properly and right in the truth of your identity. If we're going to walk this year in freedom, folks, and this is my heart for you today, this is my heart for you as a pastor and as the pastor here, it's my heart for you to walk in the freedom of the Spirit in this year. The real stuff, the real stuff in the everyday, not in the moments at conference, not in the one time a year when you get away to that weekend that's really, really great, and I was really buzzing at that weekend, but I come back to work and everything's a mess again. 
if God's Spirit is not for the everyday and He's only for the conferences, we're not going to make this thing. We're not going to be able to survive on conferences once a year. But if we recognize that our God wants to be involved in the everyday, we'll make it through whatever situations we have to face, whatever challenge, whatever we're walking through this week. See, I want you to be released from the burden that you need to be more than what you are. I want you to be released from that burden for us to, we're constantly telling ourselves we're not enough, we're not good enough, I'm not this enough, I'm not that enough, I need to have more of this, I need to have more of that. Folks, we need to just cast that off. We need to leave that at the front door and never pick it up again. What God has made us now, today, is enough because it's all that we can be. He's the one that made us. He's the one that redeemed us. He's the one that made us a child of God today. So whatever that looks like, that's enough. That's enough for him. It should be enough for us. We are children of God. Yes, we're up and down. We are temples of the Holy Spirit, and we're also jars of clay. See, we're these things all at the same time, and we walk this journey. We walk this life with God. The wonder and the beauty of that reality amazes me, that sometimes I'm passionate. Sometimes I'm not as passionate. Sometimes I'm aware that I'm carrying the Holy Spirit within me, and I'm, I'm ready to go for it. And other times I'm thinking, oh, I'm just flesh and bone. But that's the reality of our Christian experience, folks, and that's okay, because both of those things are revealed in Scripture. See, there's something great that happens when we're aware and we're free to be who God has made, God has made us to be. Something beautiful happens. Something wonderful happens. We are being robbed, a lot of us, of our present joy that is ours in Christ because we're trying to be something more than what we are. We're robbed. The enemy is robbing us because he's telling us that we're not enough. He's telling us that we're not good enough, we're not doing enough, we're not changing the world enough, and we're being robbed of our present joy when we should be people of life and joy and freedom in the Spirit today. I think we need to, how many of us have struggled with this over the years, this crippling weight on our shoulders, that we're not enough for God. We're meant to be people of liberty, of life, of an easy yoke and light burden. That's who we're meant to be. That's who we're called to be. That's who we are. And all we have to do, all you have to do as a Christian is abide in Christ. Now, does that sound simple? It's a bit of a challenge sometimes, but it's in essence, it's a simple thing to do. Abide in him. Abide in me, as Jesus said to his followers, and that's enough. I'll do the rest. All you have to do is be a son and daughter of God. Your identity in Christ will work itself out. See, your identity always comes to the fore. Who you are always works itself out. And if you recognize that you're a child of God, that'll work itself out. But if you keep believing that you're not, and that you're not good enough, that's going to work itself out too. You just be the child of God that God has made you to be. And the other analogy that Jesus gives is you be the branch and the fruit will work itself out. You be the branch, the fruit will work itself out. One of the most revolutionary things that Jesus said is in Matthew 11, verse 28. Go to it with me if you would, please. Hopefully you're still with me. I know this is maybe a, it's a different way to look at vision and look at moving forward, but Folks, truthfully, and I'll be honest, my years in church have taught me this, that people get tired, and you get tired whenever it's all hype, 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 hype. You're going to change the world. You're going to change the world. Everything's going to be great. You're going to raise the dead, blah, blah, blah. And then you get to Monday morning, and things aren't like that. And you go, what's this all about? I think in our Western context, we've got sucked into the world's way of thinking about this Christian life where we're always looking for the big and we're not appreciating the thing that God's actually doing underneath the surface. So it's important. Matthew 11, verse 28, Jesus said these words and they were revolutionary as many of the things he said were to that culture. Come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy, and my burden is light. This is Jesus. These are his words. This is what he came to say to a culture and a people that were busy doing the big things for God. But Jesus comes and says something totally the opposite. 
Now, if I was making a rallying cry for followers to change the world and get on board and give their lives for me, this would probably not be a great starting point. Probably wouldn't be the point I would start at. But be guys, we're going to go out here. We're going to do X, Y, and Z. You're going to see dead men rise. You're going to see me in all my glory raised from the dead after being crucified. That's probably would be my starting point. But Jesus doesn't start there. He comes to a people who are tired and weary. He comes to a culture that's trying to do the big things for God, like the people in Micah. What big thing are we going to do? And Jesus says something the opposite. The people that he spoke to were religiously active. They offered sacrifices. They ran to the temple at the hours of prayer consistently. They did the feasts impeccably. They did great things. What we would think were great things. The people were saying and asking, what big things can we do for God? We're going to do it. And it might seem odd on a vision Sunday to talk about rest, but folks, one thing I've learned is that we do our best work from places of rest. We do our best work as Christians from places of security and rest. Not of striving, not of struggle, not of strain, not of guilt, not of burden, but actually when we're in a place where we go, God, I'm yours, you're mine, I'm going to live for you in every day, whatever that looks like. Whether it's going into a retail shop and serving people who are kind of nasty most of the time, whether it's working for this boss that gives me a hard time every day I go in, whether it's operating and functioning in this family that there are a lot of issues in, whatever your day-to-day looks like, the Holy Spirit within you wants you to be a child of God in that situation, whatever that looks like, whether it looks dramatic or not. God does not need us. You hear me? God does not need us. If He can create the universe in a few days and with a few words, then what can we offer him? But here's the thing, folks. God wants us. He actually wants us to be a part of what he's doing. He doesn't need us. So don't think that he's some sort of cosmic slave master or taskmaster. He's not like that at all because he doesn't even need us to be involved. And many times we slow slow him down, but he wants us to be involved. It's like the joy of a father or a mother with a child saying, come and help me do this come and help me do this wee job. I get Zoe sometimes to bring her wee um, plastic tool kit and come and be scraping the mirrors and the windows, you know, come and do this wee job with me, Zoe, and I'm trying to put a TV or something up and she's poking the TV with a plastic screwdriver and it's like, it's okay, not really, get out of the way. No. <laughs> but we get fun out of that because she's a part of something with me. She's not really contributing anything. And I get the sense it's like that with us. We need to realize, folks, that God does not need us. He wants us to be involved in it with him, to enjoy the blessing of serving with him and co-workers with him. He does not call us to his purposes and plans so that he can cripple us with a weight that we're not good or effective enough. He calls us to be co-workers with him so that we can share his joy of being near him, of actually being close to him. See, Andrew shared on Thursday night at our prayer meeting about the picture of Mary and Martha as we came into a, a time of prayer together. And it's a beautiful picture, and it's so relevant for this, th- these different ways of serving God. Martha was serving God. Like when people come to your house in a culture like that, you need to be hospitable. You need to get the dishes ready. You need to get the place cleaned up. Like our own culture, someone's coming around. You want to make them feel at home. You want the place to be clean. You want the food to be ready. And that's what Martha was doing. She was serving Jesus by her service, but Mary was just sitting there. She was closer to Jesus because she was listening to what he had to say. Now, there's two pictures there, and I feel like in Northern Ireland, we're really good at the serving part, but sometimes we forget who it is that we're serving and why it is that we're serving, and we lose the joy of serving. And that's really important, folks, that we, from a place of rest and security in God, we need people to do the dishes, We need people to make the meals. We need people to be hospitable. The church and the body of Christ, we need good people like that. It's not enough to just say, I'm just, I'm going to sit at the feet of Jesus. Sometimes it's the lazy people that just sit and do nothing and say, oh, I'm sitting at the feet of Jesus, but they're not really. But that's a sermon for another time. We'll leave that for another time. Yes, where was I? But sometimes, folks, we can get lost in all the service and we can forget about the one we're serving. 
we can forget about the relationship we have with him. He doesn't need us. He wants us. He's working through us, and he wants to work through us, not to make us history makers, but to help us enjoy being children of God. That's what it's all about. Now, some of you are maybe thinking, what about our responsibility, Bill? What about what God wants from us? What about too much is given, much will be required? If you know me, um, you know that I take all that very seriously. And we'll talk about that in another stage. But what we need to get right is our starting point. We need to be standing on a firm foundation of the truth about what this is all about. Because if we don't get that right, then forget about what it is that we're going to do and the great things that we're going to do because we'll miss the one that we're serving. Our foundation needs to be right. Our starting point needs to be right. And the answer to us being effective, making a difference where we are, is about standing on the truth that we are children of God, called to enjoy Him, called to rest in Him, called to security in Him. And the second thing, the second part of the scriptures that we looked at this morning is Micah 6, 8, a very famous old scripture that's been quoted so many times, but let's look at it again. Micah chapter 6, verse 8. So Micah continues on, and then he speaks to the people <clears throat> of the day. He has shown you, O mortal, what is good. And what does the Lord require of you? To act justly, to love mercy, to walk humbly before your God. These are the words of God to us this morning. What does the Lord require of you to act justly, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with and before your God? Very simply put, to know what's right and do it, act righteously, act mercifully, and walk humbly with God. This is what God wants from us. This is what God wants from you. We overcomplicate this an awful lot, don't we? This Christian life. Do you know what is it that God's specifically saying to me at this moment in time? What might he be saying? What path might he have for me to trod? What great thing is he looking for me to do? And we spend a lot of time stressing about that. Can I submit to you? Print this verse out. Stick it on your fridge. And when you're unsure about what God wants from you, do that. Do these things. Do what you know to be right. Act righteously, act mercifully, and walk humbly before your God. Getting up every day, relying on the power of the Spirit that works in you, acknowledge God's Word, and do what you know to be right on a daily basis. Where God takes us from that point is up to Him. We leave that in His hands. If He wants you on a platform, if He wants you to start a business that grows into a national business, if He wants you to work in retail all your life behind a desk, whatever it is, that's up to him. That's not up to us. Whatever he calls you to do, where you are, you do it. You might be a teacher. You might be a worker in a shop. You might be where I was, working in suits and working in Halifax and working in the post office and the graveyard. And you might go from job to job. Whatever it is he calls you to, just do it. And do it with joy. Because he is in you in those moments. And he wants to work through you in that Remember the old song, um, it ain't what you do, it's the way that you do it. Anyone remember that? And they're singing the tune in your head, it's showing your age. As Christians, I really want to say it's not what you do, it's the heart that you do it with. It's not what you do, what great thing you do for God, it's the heart that you do it with. And whether great or small, if it's a widow offering two mites into a pot, where everyone else is offering in abundance. And God, Jesus sees it. And he says, she has offered more. It wasn't about the magnitude of her offering. It was the fact that she did it with a heart because she just wanted to give back to God. So whatever you do for God, big or small, do it with the right heart. Jesus was the beloved son, acclaimed from heaven from the voice of the Father before he had done very much at all. He was the beloved son before he had done very much at all. And we need to recognize we are children of God before we have done anything for God. And he loves us and he cherishes us and he's made a home for us with him for all eternity, not on the basis of what we have done, but on the basis of what he has accomplished on the cross. We need to get this right. 
We need to walk in the way that Micah describes. If God causes you to walk somewhere else, let him do that. And he'll tell you about that and he'll direct you because Proverbs 3 promises us that if we trust in him with all our hearts, not to lean on our own understanding, but in all our ways, say all, all, all our ways, acknowledge him. He will direct our paths. That's his promise to us. And as I bring this to a close, we Peter, I told you about earlier, who came in for his first formal suit with his mom that I had no time for because I was a history maker. And I was too busy being a history maker. We Peter was from a single parent family who were struggling for money. And we Peter needed to know that there was somebody who actually cared about him in that moment. And I get the sense that in this Western church, we're too busy playing history makers, that we're forgetting the opportunities that God has placed right in front of us. We're forgetting that the communities, families, workplaces he has actually positioned us in are actually our mission field. Please, folks, don't miss the every day because you're waiting on the big thing. Don't miss the way God wants to use you. As an 18-year-old, when I started to get a grip on some of this stuff, doing the simple things well, I began to look at putting out suits and serving customers in a whole new way. I began to understand that God is really interested in me living for Him in the normal everyday moments and in the opportunities that are presented. And I had a really incredibly blessed time in that place where I could go with that attitude and with that motivation that I was serving the King by serving these wee families and serving this, these people. Do what you know to be right. Act righteously. Act mercifully. Walk humbly before God. You'll find something really, really interesting about the New Testament. All the letters that are written to all the churches through all the different writers, they focus on and they major on the very ordinary, mundane things. All the instructions, all the challenges all gravitate around family, workplace, money, partnerships, children, giving to the poor, helping the widows. Why is it that we are focusing on other stuff that has nothing to do with those things? Why is that? Well, it's because we've been duped into believing God is only in the big things. But these are the big things, folks, because these are the things that he presents in his word. These are what we're called to. The New Testament writers under inspiration of the Spirit knew something that we sometimes overlook. The most profound change takes place in societies when God's people do the simple things right. When God's people look after their families well. When God's people raise their children well. When they walk with integrity in the workplace. When they look after their neighbors and they look after the sick. That's when society changes. Not when there's a a weekend of good meetings. Not when there's a weekend of all the hype, because that fades away very quickly. But actually, when God's people do the simple things that they're called to do in the everyday, society changes, because people see there's a real difference. I'm convinced that the world is looking for a church to do great productions, fancy lights, nice car parks, coffee on arrival, glitz and glamour, preachers with white teeth that would blind you, and hair that looks so good it looks fake. You know, I'm convinced that the world is not looking for that. But that's what we're focusing on. That's what the church are focused on. I can address our pastor better. <laughs> you know, how can, we, how can we do all these things? How can we, oh, we need to get coffee. We need to get, I love coffee. Please do coffee on arrival. But all of these things that we focus on, the glitz and the, the glamour of it all, And we think that's what the world's looking for. A broken, dying, sinful sinful world is looking for a neighbor who cares. A worker who walks in integrity, even though that means missing out on a promotion. A teacher who loves the children they teach. A tradesman who doesn't overcharge. A husband who helps. A wife that loves her children. My vision and my heart for us as as a church, is to be people walking in the everyday, doing the simple things well. And God will take care of the rest, folks. God will take care of the rest. Because the impossible stuff, that's up to Him. We do what we can do. 
please be encouraged to go and be a Christian in the everyday through the ups and the downs, the frustrations, the burdens, the pains, the moments of breakthrough. But do the simple things well. Walk in humility with your God. Love mercy, love justice. Walk in integrity. Let's pray. God, we thank you for who you are. Lord, because this is all about you. Or we are your vessels called to enjoy you, Lord, to serve you and bring you glory, but to enjoy you as well. Lord, and I pray in the days that are ahead, you would help us as a community and as individuals do the, the simple things well. Lord, please take our, our minds off of fascination with the dramatic. Lord, we live in a culture that's all about these moments of the celebrity culture, Lord, the glitz and the glamour and the drama and all of that, God. But we get the sense in these days you're calling your church to, to get real, God, to get real about who you are, to not relegate you to maybe once a year at a conference, Lord, but actually invite you and allow you to work yourself out through us in the everyday, whatever that is, God. And I pray for this room filled with people, myself included, that you would help us at the beginning of each day, like the song that we sang earlier, or early in the morning, Lord, let our song rise to you so that we enter each day with the knowledge that you go with us and in us to accomplish your purposes and plans, even if it's in ways that we do not see Lord, we know that you're working out your purposes through us. So we thank you for that privilege. And Heavenly Father, help us walk with you in your purposes in these days, we pray. In Jesus' name. And everyone said, Amen. Amen.